Hello, everyone. We are very happy to have you here for Lazy Talk Brussels. And uh, today uh, we are hosting very interesting panelists and uh, the subject, the subject that we will talk about, this is Earth. It's a sun and earth, earth and sun. So the soil pulsation occurring in the Earth's biosphere. And uh, we have uh, four panelists. Uh, it will be... Just, shall I? Yeah. Just, it will be... Um, just a name. It will be Pere Ivanova, Niki Asman, Jana Maneva, and Jasmina Matalenic. <laughs> and our always now for really just uh, our uh, moderator, our uh, also inspiring person for this later talk, Edith Dove, mm -hmm. who is the curator and the historian of us. And so she will be with us, and I will give the floor to her now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alexander. But uh, Alexander is really, Alexander Dimitriev is really the one who started this also. Um, she's just as inspiring. We like to give compliments to each other. Uh, so this is actually the, the tenth talk uh, in the series of laser talk to Brussels that we started in uh, 2021. Um, so, for those who don't know it, uh, Leonardo, Art and Science uh, Organization, started these laser talks. They take place all over the world. Uh, there's a dedicated website where you can find more information. And we were, in 21, already very excited uh, to start uh, this all. Uh, and um, this year it has been... Uh, mainly Alexandra, in fact, who has been uh, or organizing and moderating and leading the, the talks because I was busy doing something else. Uh, but I'm, I'm really happy to be back for this season, so which is uh, really exciting because for the first time we got, uh, we were subsidized by the Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles, uh, which needs to be mentioned as well. Um, so we now get paid for our effort and we can pay our guests, which, which is really nice to do as well. Um, and as usually, Silent Media Art Laboratory and Leonardo are ongoing partners. So this is uh, live streamed and afterwards, uh, the whole conversation can also be found back on uh, Alexandra's website and mine. Um, so as Alexandra already indicated, tonight's subject is motivated actually by the artistic practice based <coughs> PhD research in Echo of the Sun, conducted by Pepa Ivanova at Luca School of Arts and uh, Karel Leuven, in collaboration with the Royal Observatory of Belgium. Um, her supervisor is Dr. Esther van der Boy, who we were happy to um, <laughs> who we were happy to have in the laser talks in December 22. So it's it's kind of nice how things are connected and how. Uh, some of the former guests, like Elsa Liu, come, come back to, to visit the talks. Uh, but I like the dynamic of it all. Um, so, Pepa is an interdisciplinary artist. I will first introduce everyone to Roma, um, and researcher based in Brussels. Uh, her recent works question the epistemological values of numeric languages and their scientific and art translations. Fascinated by how to materialize temporality, she composes light and sound experiences. She constructs decaying installations as well as physical scenarios to interact with. Uh, and we, alongside her, well, you can see it's like it, it can be presented. So, can you want me on, on, the, on the video when uh, Edith presents you? She will be back. <laughs> she's she's not leaving. She can't leave the room actually because there's so many people. So Nikki Asman, uh, who is an artist with a background in film and art in science, who provides artistic, scientific, and cinematographic knowledge in experiments that use physical and chemical processes such as turbulence and fluid dynamics. Topics that serve as a metaphor for the turbulent and fluid times in which we live. Uh, by implementing natural and optical phenomena, she creates visual compositions for a sensorial 
experience and often ephemeral macro universes. And then we have our scientists, uh, Jana Maneva, uh, a heliophysicist with experience in space weather forecasting, currently working at the technical support for space weather operations at the Royal Observatory of Belgium. Uh, and you have taken an active part actually in the creation of the WANS installation by PEFA. And her input in the discussion tonight concerns the journey into the solar depth, giving an introduction of the physicality and behavior of the solar layers and plasma. That's correct. I'm not a specialist, I'm, I'm learning. This is one of the reasons why I like to be moderator of these talks so that I learn. Yeah. Um, Dr. Jasmina Magdal Magdalenic yeah, uh, is a scientist in the field of plasma astrophysics at also at the Royal Observatory of Belgium and an associate professor at Kaur Leuven at the Plasma Astrophysics Department. And her input in the discussion concerns the data and the analysis of the solar observation data and the methods of recognition and categorizing the different phenomena in the solar plasma. So although the sun is not to be seen tonight, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it will be the central subject in, in our talk. Uh, and while current research in art science focuses on uh, artificial intelligence, biomedia and human caused environmental changes, this talk discusses the Sun-Earth cohabitation. The research focuses on the physical processes of the sun captured by solar and earth observations, which become creative mediums in the conception of the artworks dedicated to the interaction of the two cosmic bodies. In the contextualization of this research, uh, PEPA examines the holistic sun-earth sun dynamics from the perspective of more than human theories. According to these, all biotic and abiotic factors on the Earth share equal importance and expand in an ecosystem with the cosmos. And in this context, I learned about Alexander Gisjevsky's holistic interaction of cosmic bodies, which is intriguing in itself, and Luciana Pagici's autopoetic agencies and algorithmic architecture in the dialogue between scientists and artists. We look at the Sun-Earth interconnection found in frequencies and pulsating in planetary processes. So bridging to the artworks resulting from the research encompass various methods and media from fictional solar data drawings translated by scientists and mixed media installation touching on the solar surface to interface composing the incoming solar events into soundscapes and an installation summarizing the entirety of the visual light on the earth so paper <laughs> i'm going to sit um you will finish your PhD this year, or oh, that's the idea? I hope in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. no pressure then. Uh, on your page of the <laughs> School of Arts, you state that you will not question our dependence on the sun, but how the advance of scientific methods brings detailed information relating to our interconnected existence. You clarify the sun-earth correlations by comparing bit-speed patterns within data observation, and you develop the performative installation to picture the entire image of light on Earth into a feedback loop of solar observations, recorded soundscapes, luminescent organisms on Earth, and artificial light sources. So the floor is for you to explain all of this in more or less 10 minutes. <laughs> so in 10 minutes I have to explain all that. No, no. <laughs> well, um, I would love to uh, just touch on some of the yeah. <laughs> all of these things, and I will be happy that um, I think naturally there will be um, relation to all of these things we just mentioned with the, even the scientific research and the research thing. Even though my research already discussed uh, this subject, I will just talk about three works. Yeah. That's uh, how I calculated. Maybe in ten minutes I can fit in, and. Uh, and just touch on the concepts, not go so much in depth, and maybe during the discussions we should go further mm -hmm. on that. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you all for uh, joining uh, in Tuesday evening, this beautiful Saturday. <laughs> so um, the image you see behind me is um, a picture which was given to me by a friend of mine who lives in Stamstone. And before I even started the research, on the sun earth cohabitation, which I've been doing for the last four years. I was interested in the, sun, the, the, the light as a medium. How uh, the solar cycles really enters, for instance, uh, uh, 
um, it's it's research more for instance people with cardiac arrest or like uh, heart heart problems. Um, the solar storms influence uh, their recoveries, um, and there's there's a lot in contemporary mm -hmm. science start like being present on on his research. But like um, I found it a bit crazy that <coughs> artistic idea that I would compare all the data, I would cr create all these graphs, and I'll see what I can do. F even like for the res for the fact that he linked the solar cycles with uh, the appearance of um, revolutions on the earth, especially in Russia, he was he was, he was sent uh, in prison. He didn't want to get out of prison because I w he wanted to finish his research on, on the book. And he's like, can I stay a few more months? So, <laughs> yes. Well, he was busy. So, um, can, you, can you start to round off? Yes, yes. this is the last uh, thing I will talk about. Okay, good. So, and this is the f um, current uh, installation I'm building. I, I'm, I built many different things, but so this is like the big uh, installation which took me most of the time because I decided to combine crafts and art. I have a background in crafts. So uh, what you see is a 3D visualization which we needed also um, for the 3D interface which controls this installation. It's made with halogen glass surfaces. <laughs> Uh, on metal structures. Each of the uh, units has its own uh, speaker and emits different types of sound, which corresponds to the uh, different types of phenomena which conceptually been told that they are appearing on the, s on the surface. The glass surfaces are made of recycled glass and the composition is uh, kind of free. And this is between the installations, uh, uh, visualization for us is important because we can control simultaneously all the pieces. It can be standalone installation, but can be also a, a, a tool I can perform live. So that's how um, I, uh, they look like. Um, so they have also these shields to shield the side, the light is out. And what you don't see here, underneath there is also speaker and uh, the box with the electronics. Um, and of course, they have different types of surfaces, which scientists can tell me what they might see in this. Yeah, they have an idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so <coughs> solar chromosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah this yeah, is yeah, a chromosphere, yeah. right? Yeah. And here, yeah. maybe I have umbra. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yes. So um, I try to be close, but not, not literal, because for me, this speculative moment was also important. So, um, and then some of them are much more fragmented and total mess, and some of them uh, are really uh, more close to uh, an something which is observed or look alike on the sun. And then, of course, the technology also uh, lead because of this recycled glass, they break a lot and so on. So um, they have their just different different types. I have like 18 of them. Okay. So <laughs> I'm not going to show all of them. Um, well, excuse, excuse me, yeah, are, are these compositions? Yes, they are different compositions. Uh, how I made them, I use uh, transparent glass, which I, I draw the composition underneath with like a very fine glass uh, sand, which is normally used for coloring if you use hot glass. And then I just place on top the recyc recycled glass from the hot shop, because I uh, work in a place when there is a blowing hot shop and I can just place them. And according, uh, de depending on the temperature, I can control the granulation, how big the bubbles can be on the top or can be absolutely flat. Yeah. And the, I draw, it's really like making drawings with glass, if you like. So can I ask that questions to all the speakers are for the end? Uh, I need it now. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's actually good. So, um, so thank it's like, yeah. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's just a matter of organization because uh, we have still three other speakers. Uh, so this is an introduction also because you just asked for quite specific terms. So in, in order to, for the audience to really understand, maybe to have this this uh, this order. So thank you, Pippa. I, I now have a question to uh, Nikki, uh, because you are specifically interested in your work uh, in turbulence and fluid dynamics, that can, which we can sort of see in this work by paper, in in, in a sense, uh, that can be di di related also directly to the uh, sun surface, and that's the reason why you're here. 
because there's clear connection between uh, the two of you. Light and heat seem to be common factors in your installations and research. And you're going to tell us more about that, I presume. Yes. <laughs> so, I'm Nikki. Thanks for being here all, and thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm a visual artist, and I make uh, sculptures. Uh, and uh, each sculpture has a different uh, uh, premium, so, uh, but they all uh, revolve around color, light, and uh, motion. Um, uh, and I have a background in film and art science, and so basically all my works are forms of expanded cinema, which basically means that I play with the cinematic apparatus. So you have the, the projector, the light, uh, the lenses, uh, uh, the space, uh, uh, the screen. I basically build my own screens uh, and I make them from different uh, materials. So like here with Solace, I made them from soap film. And uh, the works, even one of the first work already, uh, I now realized after remaking one of the older works was already uh, uh, about turbulence. Uh, and uh, it's funny how now later I start to see this red thread already from the beginning. Uh, and so I work a lot with fluids, uh, fluids and then uh, you have this turbulent motion um, and fluid dynamics. And these are all soap films. Um, so basically all my works are also sort of uh, 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 mobiles, mobiles. And um, I work with the concept of visual music. So it's music for the eyes and I make compositions uh, in time and space. Uh, another thing that connects uh, my work with the sun is that uh, why I like the sun so much is that it brings forward colors and it mm -hmm. allows us to see colors and uh, I especially tend to focus on these hyper colors. So uh, what I do, this is copper and I burn it. Um, it brings forward the color that is already intrinsic to the material and by ways of setting up uh, lighting, lightning, I bring forward these very intense colors. Um, and another concept is synesthesia, which is basically the crossing of the senses. So the soap film, you can also smell it before you enter the space, uh, you hear the sound of the mechanics. And another theme is these, these distorted reflections uh, of the materials. So this is my studio, I'm based in Rotterdam. Uh, I don't, this is not completely, but uh, I share it with many artists and uh, it allows me to have like, I'm, uh, I work very experimental, very empirical, so I basically just do experiments with lights and uh, setup and uh, materials and uh, yeah, for me this is a perfect way of, uh, by doing uh, this offering, what it means to work with uh, the, the properties of light and uh, color. I work a lot with chemicals some fire and I work a lot on location so this was a research uh, uh, for a film I did what, which I will explain a bit later which was in the north of Finland uh, and this was uh, uh, a research uh, into how light uh, changes when you start to interact with the earth like with these canyons which is a fascination of mine so uh, about the work Solis, Solis is uh, a, a large kinetic sculpture which is basically uh, a soap film. So this is it's uh, 3 by 4 meters which is a reference to old cinema, the ratio of old cinema. And uh, it's two screens so it allows me to compose with the machine. So it's a machine that's based on the algorithm but as an artist, I intervene. So sometimes, uh, uh, so it basically goes up and down. It detects when the soap film is there, when it bursts. But uh, sometimes I say go up with two screens, or just go up with one screen, or even when the soap film is still there, go down. So uh, the way the space is set up is similar like the, uh, like theater. And the way the light is set up, it brings forward the iridescent qualities of the soap film. And so this work is one of three in a triptych on soap film and uh, because the medium was so rich and uh, after a few years I started getting better at making the recipe and then the soap film will last so long that it will have these uh, turbulent uh, uh, patterns. 
and then this led to the next installation. So here you see these turbulent patterns that usually, like it starts like this and then uh, the screen sort of interacts with all the dynamics in the space. So and this is the moment when it splashes, you can even hear it. Some people start to blow against the cell phone. <laughs> so here, actually as a, as a means of an accident, during a heat wave, the cell phone was not working because it works best around this temperature of 18 degrees. So I had to think of something to make it work and uh, I managed. <laughs> and then uh, I, I, the recipe uh, uh, got better and I started to get these turbulent patterns. Uh, and I decided to make a, a second installation with it, it's called Solaris. So all the works uh, about this have the word Sol in it, which is a reference to the sun. And maybe to explain, because it's the theme of the night, uh, when I first started to experiment with uh, soap film, or soap bubbles actually, there was a mom I made an installation that I could stand in a soap bubble, and there was a moment that uh, the sun hit the soap film, and then I saw the reflection. And then I thought, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, as a means, after I started to always approach uh, mm -hmm. the, the the lights that I work with, they are basically like the, the, the uh, uh, they're not like the sun, but they're like a point light source. So they are the closest what <coughs> comes, uh, how to bring forward these colors. So Solaris is the second installation and it now has six screens. And I made, I don't make interactive work, but this one I did because you have to come close. So you can smell the soap film, you are uh, near the soap film and uh, you see like this abstract uh, film uh, happening before you, which is each time different. And yeah, so it becomes again, this small but immersive uh, experience. Um, and I will show this, uh, I think next month uh, in uh, at the Kick Festival, and then this uh, the third uh, film with uh, our, our project with soap film is called Liquid Solid. I made it together with artist Joris Travels, and this was the project we did in the north of Finland. And uh, because I thought uh, I read this thing that you could also freeze soap film, you just need very cold temperatures like minus thirty degrees. And then somebody said, then you need to go up north, mm -hmm. where it can become minus 30. So uh, uh, there's this uh, art uh, bio research station in the north of Finland, in Kilpishjörfi. Everybody was already gone, so I, I would be there together with uh, the other artists. And later we found that there was another artist who were there. And the funny thing is that there was no sun during that period because of the, the polar night. So only this twilight during the day for a few hours. And then we were able to set up outside and make a small setup to film the freezing of the soap film. But then the first week it only became like minus 12 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> but still, many good things happened and uh, uh, we realized that all the footage was super beautiful. And uh, another thing that uh, we did was to build these custom built VLF antennas. Uh, because you can uh, listen to the Aurora Boreas, which are basically the solar winds uh, from the sun. And um, so I built these uh, together with uh, another artist here in the Netherlands. Later I found out that um, they were actually designed by somebody that uh, built them for my uh, degree, so in the Netherlands. And so when I was uh, making recordings there it would it would it was too strong so it would feedback completely but still i got nice recordings um yeah and so uh, there was a lot of uh, <laughs> which was super nice mm -hmm. and very fitting to the colors of the soap film <laughs> and in the second part of the 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 residency it became minus 25 degrees which was already enough for the freezing of the soap film So the colors are a bit different uh, in real life, so this is, uh, the beamer is a bit saturated, but uh, the first half of the film is when it's minus 12 degrees and the soap film becomes more viscosity, like a little syrupy, and the second part, it, it uh, crystallizes. And so, because it's very ephemeral, we, we, you can't bring it home. We made a film out of it and we made a composition for both sound and image. They're equally important. Uh, and so it's an 18-minute film.
And what I like about it, and which is also something that recurs often, is that uh, skill is something that uh, uh, what what I find interesting is that you have these like this is like one centimeter by one centimeter, but it also reminds me of this uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, constellation in a, in a, in a cosmic in a constellation of uh, stars, and I like how you have these recurring patterns uh, uh, that you have both on the micro, macro, and cosmic scale. So uh, another project I did with the sun was e actually more literal, and it's called the abysses of the scorching sun, and it's basically uh, a machine that follows the sun. So it traces the sun throughout the day, and uh, I can set it to the coordinates of that place where I show the machine. So it's basically a sculpture that is inside the gallery but uh, traces the sun that is outside uh, the gallery. And then it projects uh, this uh, image. Uh, so it's basically a custom built projector. So you have the light source, lenses, uh, uh, the color wheels uh, and uh, mirror cons. And then again it's pointed again uh, uh, towards the wall and so each of them have their own cycle just like uh, the planets and uh, and so this for me was a project that uh, came about after an extensive research and thinking about uh, climate change so I did I was part of this uh, research project called dark ecology uh, which was also up north and it was about uh, uh, basically climate change and, and, and where we are going with this and um, it was both in Russia and in Norway and the contrast between the two of them was bizarre while they were only like half an hour apart. So this is the nickel factory in Russia. Mm. Um, and so that le uh, led me to do research. People spoke there like Timothy Morton and I read uh, research mm. of uh, James Lovelock uh, uh, which basically it all led to this <laughs> giant depression of realizing, okay, we are going in the wrong direction. And uh, I think uh, the work uh, was for me a way to deal with these feelings of anxiety and, and also a uh, feeling of what can you do or can we do something. And I think uh, the work, um, so I started to think about time and basically by zooming out and looking at time from a cosmic, cosmic scale, then uh, it put things for me into perspective. Like, we are only here for a small period of time. Um, these perpetual mobiles, like the sun and the earth, they're not really perpetual mobiles, but they're quite uh, close. <laughs> um, so it, uh, it, it's, it's a piece about all these different uh, cycles and planets that have their own uh, time and uh, 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 existence in this cosmic uh, universe. So this is part uh, pictures of uh, the research that I did and I was inspired by um, uh, also this work I really like sometimes mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. Nancy Holt. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an earthwork from the 70s and she made it that it aligns with the sun on the solar <coughs> axis. Um, and there's even more to it, but it's a very uh, nice way of uh, being connected to <coughs> how the sun works. Uh, um, uh, uh, on a very bodily uh, uh, way, and I think for me also the installation that that I made, uh, uh, like I sort of now more understand intuitively how the sun works and also in different places, and which sounds weird, but it does. It does uh, give you this knowledge. Uh, yeah, and uh, I've shown it on. S uh, several cases. It works really well in churches, old churches. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and again, it, this composition of sound was made uh, by another artist, Joost Rebels, and uh, it's, it's reminiscent of these old science fiction films, which was another influence uh, of the work. And so I like how this work, uh, it's a place where you can be with people, and it's also for me how I dealt with these feelings of anxiety about climate change was also by sharing these feelings in this work and sharing this uh, uh, by being together, by being entangled in this space. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, really
great stories. Really wonderful discovery of your work and of papers, of course, as well. Uh, we got now pop over to the scientific. Uh, starting with Jana Maneva. Um, you've actually taken an active part in, in the installation once by a paper. And can you tell us a bit about this collaboration and how you can have access to the solar depth? Sure, I'll try. So it was uh, not very straightforward for me to decide the level of the talk. So, you know, it's always a challenge as a scientist to, to judge how much time should you put through and how much general knowledge. And of course, some people might be more curious. So here I'm mentioning some basic things and, <laughs> you know, so a lot of scientific explanations I've left out, but still you would see some things, hopefully. So uh, I'm here to, uh, to give this talk. We had this nice collaboration with Peppa and at uh, the Royal Observatory on the scientific side. We are actually, we have a center where we are monitoring the, uh, the sun 24 seven. And so for this you see we are using different means. Uh, and what we do, especially at the Royal Observatory, we have like a regional warning center. So part of this regional warning center is to provide really uh, some services related to different events of the sun and uh, what they could cause to work. For example, like you are all familiar with bulletins for geomagnetic storms or, you know, like some um, energetic particles in the near, near Earth environment. So we would be writing these bulletins on a daily basis and we are, we are also issuing some warnings when we see that the conditions uh, are elevated and we can expect certain problems. So that's kind of a little bit what our team at the Royal Observatory does. And we also try to forecast a little bit um, such impacts ahead mm -hmm. in advance. And so that's what we do. But uh, OK, so first, before I go into this collaboration and anything, I just wanted to say a few things about the sun. And of course, the sun is our star. It's our closest star, right? So it's a main sequence star. And uh, there are many things that can be said about it. But you see, for example, an interesting fact is that if you think in terms of the solar system, it's uh, like more than 99% of the mass. So it's really very massive. If you are to put to the Earth, it would be like a very, very tiny, like almost invisible point on, on this image in, in this scale. So uh, it, it's like really a much larger fraction. Uh, and then like it's interesting, for example, if you see the sun and there is certain event on the sun that uh, it's, let's say, an outburst of electromagnetic radiation. And then you might be curious, like, oh, so how, how late, uh, how long should I wait to get to see this light on Earth? So the time is about eight minutes. So, you know, it takes about eight minutes uh, for the light from the sun to reach us here on Earth. So it's quite short, but it, it's not seconds. It's eight minutes. Uh, but yeah, it's relatively short. And uh, then you can see just a little bit of things like what is the distance between the sun and the earth. So normally in science, we always call this astronomical unit. It's one astronomical unit, but here you can see it. It's uh, a bit less than 150 million kilometers. And you can see things about the composition of the sun. The sun is composed primarily of hydrogen and some helium. So this is what actually drives the sun. So it's on this, what we call this main sequence star. So in the core, there is the thermonuclear synthesis that gives actually, uh, this is the energy source of the sun, right? So if you think in terms of layers, the sun is not like um, a solid ball that is more or less uniform across, right? So the sun has different layers that um, it has like also changing composition, but certainly changing density and changing temperature across its different layers. So that's very interesting. Um, and you know, in the core is where this synthesis goes on. So of course, the temperature there is highest still for this type of star. But uh, as you go further out, so when you have so much energy, first you reach this place where you have to, to get rid of this energy somehow. So, you know, that's uh, we call it so-called radiation zone. So it's where some of this uh, energy is a little bit trapped, so it's kind of being transformed from atom to atom, and it takes a long time until it actually leaves uh, and goes out to the next layers of the mm -hmm. sun. Yeah, so this is a, like a long process, so to speak, a long term. 
And then if you go further away, then you would reach something that, um, so you can also like look on the other picture, both, both are complementary. But if you go uh, uh, further out, you would reach something called the convective zone. That's, uh, that's where a lot of turbulence happens in a way because you have a lot of convection, like there's a, uh, a lot of like this, it's kind of putting things on the stove, right? Where they start to make bubbles and they form these kind of different uh, convective patterns. And so that's the convection zone. And then we have like the other layers on top. So you would have like um, already the atmosphere, the solar atmosphere. You have the photosphere, which we see. So when you, whenever you look with a telescope uh, towards the sun or you see these images, normally you see the photosphere. And so these dark spots that you see here, so those are called sun sunspots and, and they are on the solar surface. So we see them like, uh, if you have like an amateur um, telescope, or maybe sometimes for big spots, even with your phone, you could capture something, but you need a kind of a good camera for it, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, so these things like the sunspots, they, they are visible on the surface. So it's the photosphere. And then uh, these sunspots actually, they're related to things called active regions. So they are, they are very related. And these active regions are important to us because they produce uh, some of the solar activity that's actually driving a lot of the processes that, I mean, events uh, that are reaching us on Earth. So these active regions, for example, are responsible for so-called flares. So these kind of images here. So this flaring is related to the active regions. Um, and the flares, you know, they can be seen as like a very impulsive outburst of radiation. So the radiation from the flares reaches us very quickly, as we saw, eight minutes, more or less. Uh, but why is it important? I mean, it's very beautiful to see it, but why is it important on Earth? Well, it's important because um, <coughs> if this radiation, like if this flare has certain intensities, then it can actually jam our radio, uh, you know, it can cause like real, some real impact uh, for us and our activities. Mm -hmm. So it's important. And then we have like different uh, things, like we have chromosphere, photosphere, so it's like very dynamic things. And we also have, it's a very zoo of effects on the sun, and <laughs> it's not trivial to summarize them, but we have certain things like what you'll see here, sometimes we, we see some darker um, areas on the sun. Well, if you look at them in the corona, because after the, the atmosphere, the uppermost part of the atmosphere is uh, so-called corona, solar corona. And surprisingly, it's actually rather hot, because there's this, this thing called transition region, where instead of the temperature dropping, dropping, dropping as you go out from the core, mm -hmm. then at some point, there is a jump, like two orders of magnitude, and all of a sudden the corona is very hot. The solar corona is much hotter than the uh, inner atmospheric layer. So this is still like something that's worth ongoing investigation. But either way, so in the corona, we have these things called coronal holes, and uh, they are also like one, one of the, in a way, one of the drivers for space weather events. It's, um, you would, we would see it in a little bit. And then we have like prominences and other things. Why is the prominence here interesting or nice? Well, uh, sometimes all these prominence you see like are some plasma that is like from the lower atmosphere and it's visible uh, higher up in the corona. But sometimes uh, it can twist. So the plasma normally sits on something that we call magnetic loops and it's tied to the magnetic field on the sun. Mm -hmm. And then these magnetic fields, sometimes they twist. And when they twist too much, it's a little bit like the spring. So they can twist, twist, and at some point, they, they kind of, there is an outburst. So they break, they break out. And so when they, um, there is enough energy like to really, um, for the spring that it cannot hold its uh, state anymore, so it needs to release. The, uh, and then what happens is that a lot of the mass is released together. Mm. And so the sun, uh, there is like um, an eruption that uh, leads to really the sun losing some of, some of its uh, atmosphere, like some of, uh, some of the mass goes out, and this is what we call coronal mass ejection normally. So prominences uh, are one of the sources for coronal mass ejections. Um, and sometimes flares also can be related to coronal mass ejections. Okay, so we will come back to, to the sun a little bit, uh, in a little bit, but 
now that we've seen some basic things about it, let's see, like, how do we know these things about the sun, right? So mm -hmm. it's interesting. How do, we <coughs> how do we monitor the sun? So a way to monitor the sun, of course, we have different ways. So one is from space. So we have a lot of different spacecraft. And here, like, is, um, mm, well, it's not all the spacecraft that's out there, okay? So this is just one setup of spacecraft that, uh, <laughs> and actually a lot of these ones here are really monitoring the sun and the solar wind, and a lot of them are used uh, for, for operational space weather, well, not for operational, for operational they are fewer that are used for operational activities, like SDO is used for operational activities, uh, SOHO, which I don't see, STERO is used for operational activities, uh, PROBA2, so a subsection of this uh, spacecraft is really used for operational activities and the rest is used for scientific research. And you know, we need to complement like science and operations and impacts because as Peppa said, many things are interconnected. So we need uh, the um, synthesis of both like science and operations. So one way to, well, just to mention here, we have like this, the Proba 2 that you see, uh, Proba 2 satellite over there is, is Belgian satellite, so it's very nice to know. And there is also already a planned launch of Proba 3 that is going to be like the next uh, mission. It's going to be Belgian as well, so it's uh, uh, Belgium with some ESA also, like ESA support for the launch and some ESA funding. So it's uh, very nice to, to know that Belgium is heavily involved in, in these studies. Mm -hmm. And another way to study the sun and to look at it is from ground. And from ground, uh, this is far not extensive view. We have a lot of different observatories all over the world, okay? And uh, here I list just some of the solar observatories. And on top of this, this is really a very, very limited view. But yet again, so you see that there are some large telescopes that look at <coughs> different layers on the sun as well, so they help us. Uh, both scientifically and operationally to, to study the sun and also to look at the possible impacts uh, and what we would expect in terms of activity and in terms of uh, space weather. And again, one of them is in Luco, so it's actually a Royal Observatory. Uh, it's where I work, and this is the USAT. Uh, so we have like this team that are daily observing the sun, they do daily uh, observations. So here you see like uh, an example of the photosphere in white light. And here you see, I think it's uh, um, calcium, uh, uh, the calcium line. So you, you see like how we, we look at the sun whenever the, there are no clouds, <laughs> and whenever we can, <laughs> we, we do it daily. <laughs> um, and it's also done in Belgium. Uh, so just uh, yes, just a little bit give a flavor <laughs> of the space weather services we do at the Royal Observatory uh, about them and this uh, regional warning center. So the regional warning center is really uh, an international, uh, well, it's a national regional warning center, but it's part of an international uh, ISIS regional warning centers. And this one is located in the Royal Observatory, so it's part of the Royal Observatory. Uh, so some of it is, as I say, we do. 24-7 uh, monitoring of the sun via different means. So either via the spacecraft that we already have in-house, so Proba 2 or 3, or also we have solar orbiter as a complementary uh, tool because it doesn't, it's not giving operational data every day, but it does give data every now and then that we can use whenever it's available. <coughs> and we also, um, we also monitor like uh, other spacecraft that's really operational. Like for example, we host uh, the data for the SDO. Uh, so we are doing like some also data storage and you know like uh, providing it also to, to external work on certain extent. And the SDO is really nice um, uh, spacecraft because uh, here you can see that it has a lot of different uh, uh, spectral lines in which it's observing. So it has different instruments uh, and then it observes like the sun in the different layers. So here you can see, for example, the photosphere there, the chromosphere. So you can see the corona here. Uh, and then, yeah, there are several um, filters for the corona, so to speak. So you can look at the corona in, in different uh, filters. And we can also retrieve some information about the magnetic field on the solar surface, or at least on the visible side from the Earth. 
So this this is like all information that we are using on daily basis to, to say something about the solar activity. Mm -hmm. Because as I told you, the plasma on the sun and uh, magnetic fields are um, very interconnected and so they, there's a lot of interaction between them. So it's important to monitor both. And as you would see on this image, I'm not sure if my pointer would go there, but like there are some, some spotted areas in the magnetogram, so it tells us something about the active regions as well. Yeah. So it's, it's all connected. So if you will go to our website, <laughs> you would find a lot about these things. And you know, like uh, we, we do give some information about the ground-based <coughs> measurements. And we also have this radio measurement in command that uh, I think Yasmina will talk about uh, a bit later. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. And what I do, I'm like in this uh, space weather forecasting group that, um, or, well, it's space weather operation group, that we do all the, the forecasts, the alerting, and the, the support of different tools that help us ingest the data and monitor it uh, in, in the means that we need. You know. So we also write these daily bulletins about the solar activity and the geomagnetic conditions and the solar wind activity. So you can read about it uh, and you can subscribe for it on our website. It's free for all. So you can just uh, subscribe. Speaking in terms of the sun and space weather and the operations we do, let's just say a little bit like why they are important. So I tried to sum it up in the beginning, but yeah, the sun is really the main driver of what we call the space weather. And what is the space weather? Well, it's, um, you know, all these different phenomena that you can have, like, so the drivers of space weather are either these CMEs, the coronal mass ejections, or the flares. Uh, so they are like eruptions or the coronal hosts that are the non-eruptive drivers. But what the space weather can cause is problem with the communication, with either radio communication or navigation or satellite communication occasionally, and also poses like different various risks for aircraft safety, for like the astronauts in the near Earth space, like you know, that are uh, on the International Space Station, for example. It also poses, can pose risk um, to damage satellites. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's damaging satellites and sometimes it prevents satellites to lift off. Should we just, uh, today it, I read another article because you know, we had this uh, major geomagnetic storm. We're having it, like had it this morning. And I, I read an article that there was like, again, some trouble with the lift off. Uh, so um, there is like, um, increased atmospheric track when, uh, with certain space weather conditions, so it makes it harder for satellites to lift off or they need to adjust mm -hmm. either trust more, I mean to, to put more fuel to, to increase their trust, or to do other things uh, to, to uh, correct for that. So sometimes, yeah, there are cases which are known that satellites have been lost because uh, well, they had problems at launch, or so sometimes electro electronics can stop working. Mm -hmm. So it's really like a uh, various input. And what's also it, um, another effect that can happen is that um, certain like long pipelines on Earth um, can sometimes burn out during strong events. And so this is uh, something to be aware of. Uh, and so it can, like there, there have been cases of storms where, which have caused problems to the electric grid, like disruptions to the electric grid uh, or like to long cable communications. Um, so this I wanted to show you like something when I was saying about all these various drivers of the space weather. So here is like a little bit of a sum up. So this here is the only non-eruptive driver of space weather. So these are the so-called coronal holes. Uh, you see these uh, dark areas. If you look at the corona in any of the coronal filters, you would see these dark areas, which we call the coronal holes. So they are um, believed to, to be the source of uh, fast solar wind, and this fast solar wind like, can actually uh, cause geomagnetic storms as well, and so it disturbs or like enhanced uh, particle precipitation, or so it, it's um, really um, one of the overlooked drivers. Of course, for big disruptions, uh, we, we most of the time we need like an eruptive event, uh, something like, let's see if this is going to play. Sorry. No, it doesn't want to play today, so uh, I'm not bit just playing. Yeah. yeah, so this eruptive event, for example, this is, uh, the, you see the sun mm, in the center, it's actually superposition of different instruments that allows you to, to see it like this. 
Otherwise, the movie is uh, shown from different coronagraphs. So it shows you an example of how these uh, coronal mass ejections uh, look like, uh, you know, in interplanetary <coughs> space. So you can really see them. Oops, you can really see them with. Um, yeah, apologies for that. But you can really see the the particles as as they. Um, move and propagate towards uh, the Earth or other planets yeah, and generally in the interplanetary space. Um, so some of the things that happen are, for example, we can have these radio blackouts. So they are related to these uh, impulsive events which are called pairs. Uh, and um, yeah, this is really like a, just a strong uh, outburst of um, electromagnetic radiation. and. You know, we have ways of like uh, seeing that. We have certain ways of forecasting it to some extent, uh, and uh, so we can forecast a little bit like what could be ex um, expected impacts, and we can have impacts on like the radio communications on other things. Uh, this is another example of space weather stuff, and this is with impacts uh, from radiation. And uh, radiation, as I told you, it can impact like spacecraft, but it can also impact like uh, flights. This is a new project that we are now looking at. Uh, it's really the impact of uh, space weather related increased radiation on, on the flights at different routes and different locations. And also it brings us like uh, more aurora, like to places mm. where we don't expect it. So it can be pleasant for the eye as well. <laughs> uh, all right, so just to, to before I finish, I wanted to, to say how it was working with Pepa and, uh, you know, uh, trying to combine art and science. So uh, that's a great uh, challenge. And it's also like an eye opener. It, mm. it makes you like, you know, um, yeah, it kind of opens up your horizons. So for example, you try to represent like a certain um, phenomena on the sun or certain layers of the solar atmosphere and you want to make them in an artistic way. So you, you, you tell an artist like, well, this is how more or less, you know, a filament would look like and here is what you get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting view, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's rather, it's rather uh, close, understandable are like, well, this is what we would like to have as the chromosphere, but uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's slightly different. And yet that, that's what makes, uh, that's the beauty of art, right? Yeah. So that's really the beauty of art. Uh, now I should have put her very last picture here to see how lovely sunspot we have, but <laughs> okay, so this is a close-up example of a sunspot with uh, different structures inside. But this is taken from the ground for very, very good resolution. And um, in space, we don't see them so well. But so here is what we kind of got in the art view. So yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can find us online or just check our website. Well, we, we hopefully have some time to ask you questions uh, after. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then I uh, will go quickly. I hope it's still OK for for the length because there's so much to talk about. It, that's, it, it, it shows how rich the subject is. It's really fantastic. So Yasmina, um, uh, for you, how can we interpret solar observation data and which methods of recognition and categorizing the different phenomena in the solar uh, plasma are used? That was the question that I sort of set up. Maybe it's it's not completely <laughs> what you want to talk about, but... So, what I actually would like to talk about is what we worked with... Uh, yeah, how you, but how you observe, because yes. what, so what intrigued me just now in, in, in what uh, Nikki was saying is, is... And that's actually already one of the questions that I wanted to pose, so maybe you can... Because since when is the sun a subject, I guess, in science, I guess, from the very first moment, because it's such an important uh, presence for, uh, for mm -hmm. us. Uh, but for instance, when you showed the core, mm -hmm. I wondered, how do you know that there's a core? Because you cannot really come close to the sun, I, I suppose. Uh, the, the satellites, you, you showed an image of a satellite really close, but I guess that's impossible that it comes that close. Um, so can you tell, well, Tell me from your point of view how you use the data, maybe? So, 
yeah, I mean, what we did with Peppa is uh, we worked on the radio observations. Yeah. So what is for for me and what in general the radio observations are like? If you imagine that you you want to paint a picture. Yeah. And you have want to have a nice picture, then you really need to have a lot of colors. Mm. If you use only black, you will see only certain things. Yeah. You cannot make a paysage with a black only. Mm. So you need the red and green and mm. blue and yellow. Mm. The same way is like in the solar physics. What uh, Jana was showing, she was showing different wavelengths. Where yeah. How we see the sun on different wavelengths. And uh, each of the wavelengths gives a certain information about the sun. Mm -hmm. The same way as the radio gives a certain information about the sun. Maybe about the, the interior and the layers of the sun. Just to say uh, before I start with my presentation. is like if you're looking at the certain uh, 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 frequencies uh, and wavelengths, then you, you see the different temperatures. Mm -hmm. And with using these different temperatures, you can actually understand on how the the sun is 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 made how oh the yeah, okay. how the uh, the basically plasma because sun is a big ball of plasma which means it's uh, like quasi neutral uh, mm. uh, um, let's say quasi neutral mixture of particles mm. so how how actually they feel follow the field lines because everything which is uh, on the sun go, uh, is guided by one single thing, and that's its magnetic field. Mm. So magnetic field of the sun is the main player there. So the plasma follows the magnetic field line. As the magnetic field line is becoming more twisted, you have this uh, sunspots which are emerging, which Jana was showing, which are emerging on the solar surface, and which cause the solar activity. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to show is how the solar radio observations and what part of the picture the radio observations actually mm. give. So what we see here is the, 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 the solar array, which is presently not fully in use. This is our main uh, solar array, which was uh, in uh, 19, uh, around 36 or something like that. It was the biggest array in the world when it was made. Unfortunately, it was not working too long, and now we are trying to refurbish, and now we are having our own observations in Belgium also. So what you see here is one so-called dynamic radio specter, and which shows the intensity of the radio emission. Different colors means different intensities, and this is what we worked with Peppa. So she brought a, a nice collage of, of colorful paintings. And then I said, OK, let's see what kind of a solar radio emission I see in these paintings. Mm. And that is what we did. Unfortunately, I have no paintings here. But yeah. Yeah, I, was, I had like one slide I had to show that one to Ali. Yeah. yeah. So as I was saying, as, as the radio observations are only one part of the full spectrum, so of the uh, full uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum and, uh, of the s which we can see from the sun, and we see that this is the blue is the, the part of the, the wavelengths uh, which are covered uh, in the radio observations from the, uh, from the Earth and from the space which we have of the Sun. And of course we have all, uh, the all different uh, energies which uh, as we are going to the uh, shorter wavelengths, we are also going to the, the higher energies. So we, we, we see that actually the radio waves are going to uh, rather small energies comparing to other type of emission from the sun, but they are very, very important. So uh, as we are going away from the sun, everything which we observe in different frequencies, uh, uh, because the frequency is mapping the, the density of the plasma, and the plasma is decreasing as we go mm. away from the sun, this is how also the frequency is decreasing, but the wavelength, because they are uh, pro uh, 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 anti-proportional, the wavelet is changing in different ways. So they, the frequency is decreasing, but the wavelet is increasing. It's just a small note. So how do we see the, the radio emission from the sun? What we see here is that this is the, the, the in the uh, y-axis is the frequency, and the, in the x-axis is the time, which shows this is the so-called dynamic spectra. And it shows when we are going, as the arrow shows, the frequency is decreasing, which means everything which goes up goes away from the sun. So we, we see that these this dark things, these are so-called type 3 radio bursts, 
They're going away from the sun. And the steeper it goes, which means they need less time because we have the, 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 the uh, x-axis is the time scale. So they are going very, very fast away from the sun. While these things, the, the more, uh, the, the more uh, less steep, the more uh, slowly going away from the sun, that's a so-called signature of shock waves. Mm -hmm. And the shock waves are very important. So as Jana was saying, during the, the, the solar activity, during the eruptive processes on the sun, there is a really a, a, the full spectrum of things which are happening. Plasma is being heated. Plasma is ejected from the sun. The shock waves and particles are being, being accelerated. And there, as you see here in this small sketch, I'm not going into the details. So there is a, a, this is a kind of a model how the, the eruption happens. So the, the, the field lines go up. And in certain moments, it comes to the, the, the so-called reconnection. And then the things erupt above. And we have the post-eruptive loops, which stay on the bottom. And they are very bright, as Jana was showing, because there is a lot of plasma in them, because there is a lot of heat which is eman emanating. If we would manage to get the energy which is released during one of the middle of the flares, we would have the energy at the Earth for the whole Earth for years. Mm -hmm. So that is the amount of the energy which is being released from the sun. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we were looking at the different uh, uh, paintings of, of uh, Peppa, we, we saw also different type of a burst. Uh, you asked when we started to see the sun with the, the solar radio physics is a very old. It's still from the 60s, from, from the last century, mm -hmm. which means we have like 80, 90 years uh, of the observations. And that were one of the first observations of the sun because they are possible to be made from the ground. So the first radio telescopes were already mapping the radio signatures uh, of the sun. And uh, uh, this is why the, we have, as they were finding different type of the radio emission, they were naming them type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4. And all these different types, they are related with the diff different processes. For example, type 1 emission is uh, related with the small reconnection processes and small turbulence things, which happens above the active regions, so a strong magnetic field and a lot of different things of everything plasma is mixing because one what sun is not, it's not static. Everything moves there for mm. always mm. on the different scales, on the small scales, on the big scales of big eruptions. Everything is very dynamic. So then the other second type of, of the uh, mission which uh, scientists managed to, to find were type twos which are associated with the shock waves. And that's a one for us, one of the most important and for me that are my really uh, like favorite type of radio emission. So this is the emission which is associated uh, uh, of the fast electrons which are uh, generating radio emission at the shock front. <coughs> As the, this shock front propagates following the radio emission, we can follow the shock waves. Mm -hmm. And what was Jana saying, we can actually forecast when the geomagnetic storm will arrive to the Earth using these radio observations. I will show this a little bit later. There are also the other type, two types of the uh, radio bursts. So this is the kind of a sketch of the coronal mass ejection. And the, the, I placed a different type of radio emissions uh, approximately where they appear. Uh, so the type 3 bursts, are, these are related with the fast, but very fast, one third of the speed of light electrons, which, which move away along open or quasi open field uh, magnetic field lines from the sun, really very fast processes. And then we have type fours, which are directly re related, uh, like emission from the, from the cores of the, of the coronal mass ejections. How this looks like in our observations and what we also see in, in, Petra, in, in Peppa's uh, 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 drawings. So we see first the, the little spotty things, the type ones, which are actually the emission which comes above the active regions, really, because it's a lot of small things like everywhere. It, it's, it's really like a small sparkle, small radio sparkles. And then here and this dynamic spectra, these are all the time dynamic spectra, like I've shown before. You have the fast, uh, very fast, uh, one third of the speed of light beams of electrons, which make the type three emission. Then the shock signatures, the type two emission, slowly, much more slowly drifting about 
let's say, 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers per second velocity, so all these shocks. And the, the type 4 emission, which comes from the, the within the CME. So once the, the, the eruptive event happened, like, like Jana was saying before, thank you, Jana, for the introduction. <laughs> so it's much easier now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we want to understand when, when the, the arrival of the shock will be at the Earth. And what it will cause? It will cause beautiful auroras, which you have seen. I'm very jealous. I've never seen them. Uh, <laughs> so yes, uh, so it will cause beautiful auroras. So th this is one of the manifestation of arrival of disturbance to the Earth. And how we can use the radio observations? If we have ground-based observations, we can have a low coronal shocks. And we can, in order of 15 minutes, say, OK, we have a shock which, which is probably propagating towards the Earth because we see it from the visible side of the sun. And then further on, but this is always a question, is it a flare or the, or the coronal mass ejection we generated that shock? Because if it's a coronal mass ejection, the shock will propagate further away, and then it will be seen as this, this so-called interplanetary type to which I've shown before. So like continuation of the shock. So shock goes, oh, it just comes by itself. Shock goes the away from the sun, and as it goes, we map it. it it's like leaving the traces in, in, the, in the snow. This is what the shock does for us. So we, we can understand how fast it goes. And then we can understand when we will see the auroras. And there is a, even, even a small program which is being made, which is for aurora hunters. Mm -hmm. So that people who, who will love to see auroras, they, they can understand how and when auroras will happen. So, and how, as I said before, the, the radio is only one, one paint uh, in, in order to make the full picture. So we have a big coronal mass ejections, which are here observed from two different viewing points. And then using this, we are able to reconstruct the, the, the three d structure of this, this three coronal mass ejection. And once we reconstruct it, we also can do that for the radio observations, as we see it from the different spacecraft, we can understand exactly where the radio emission is propagating, which is fascinating. And now wh what we did in, the, in this work is like we combined the two things. We have the reconstructed, the coronal mass ejection, which is this wire thing, and we also reconstructed the, the, the radio emission. And once we put them together, it's very clear where radio emission is coming from and how it is generated. In this case, as we see, it's, this is the kind of a streamer region where our open field lines, it, it, uh, the, due, due to when the shock interacted with the streamer region, it caused the radio emission, which is very important because this means that the radio emission is coming from this part of the CME and not this part of the CME. So if it comes to the Earth and it makes aurora, it will come a bit later than we think mm -hmm. because this is a, a more away from the sun than this region. So when we do the use radio observations for forecasting, we have to be careful because we have to know exactly where the radio emission is coming from. Of course, not only shock signatures can be mapped, but also the, the type 3 bursts can be mapped. This is the, the, these bubbles show the, 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 how the type 3 radio emission propagates. These very fast semi-relativistic electron beams which go away from the sun. And why they're important? Because they show the magnetic field configuration and they show how the Earth is connected with the magnetic field to the Sun, which is extremely important because of these strong particle events, which Anna also mentioned earlier, which can cause uh, all kind of uh, disturbances in the, in, the solar, in the Earth atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And at the end, of course, as were all the paintings which, which, which Pepper made, this is how the sun makes the paintings. Mm. So I have put here a number of different type two bursts, so you can see how how differently they can look depending on the on the what sun made from them, on through which environment they propagate, how fast they propagate. You <coughs> see, here there are many lanes which show that this is the emission coming <coughs> from very very wide region on the shock, really in all directions. These ones are kind of more nice and more more narrow which means this is a specific region on the shock where the emission is coming from. So 
sun never makes two the same, like the artists. So our sun is also a big artist. Mm -hmm. So it's not possible to have two the same ones. So what we need to do, we need to use our imagination. So we have to be a little bit artistic also in order to be able to recognize what we see on this dynamic spectra, what we see from the radio observations. And then, once again, um, this is something which I didn't talk about because uh, time is limited, of course. What you see here is, is like uh, the emission from the type, type 3 burst, mm -hmm. but also this is type 3 burst. And there is also a small, many, many small millisecond radio emission structures which talk about a so small fragmentation of, of, of the, the radio emission which is on the such a small scales and that we can see only now because only now uh, since last couple of years we have also this this is a LOFAR I don't know how much you've heard about the LOFAR LOFAR is a big telescope array which uh, is in interferometer. What does it mean? It has an, a many stations along the whole Europe. The, the, the main station, so-called the, 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 the basic station, is, is, is in Holland. Uh, and uh, uh, then this is the, like, uh, the, the core stations. And then there are stations which are on different places, some in France, some in Germany, some in Spain. There is one which is, which is uh, uh, on the very north, uh, and it's about like 1,500 kilometers away from the first station. So each of these stations connects, collects the solar signal, collects the emission from the sun, <coughs> and then it makes this kind of art. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a really art. And if you look, more you zoom, so more you look into these small things, more you will see. It's like it never ends. It, it goes. Uh, it actually the only limitations is not the sun and the physical processes, but our ability to see the sun, which means the resolution of our instruments. So there is many more which can uh, more than we see which sun can produce for us. Well, thank you very much. I would like to ask some questions bef before giving the, the audience also the possibility to ask some questions. Um, first, I think that, that we have two artists that never do the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think you, in, in what you showed in your work with, with the soap films or, or mm -hmm. with your last installation, that there's also this variety and, and that there's a really nice interaction between what you they do as artists and you as scientists and and what what you just said shows as well the artistic part of science and the scientific part of artists i think um i understood that there's that there's a uh, um, solar cycle of 11 years is yes. that right yes. uh, so you said that they started more or less in the 50s the 1950s to so and in that period, they discovered that there's a, si a solar cycle of about 11 years. This was already known earlier. No, that was no, earlier. No, yeah. Yeah. This yeah, is the radio. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but, but the thing is that, you know, when you speak about so when does the research on the sun started or like the interest of the sun, yeah. but this is before Christ. Of yeah, course, yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, this yeah. is our source of energy. Yeah, and yeah. so with the first eclipse, I guess, the people saw. Yeah, so they, they slowly already like, yeah, yeah. whoa, yeah. what is that? What is causing it? So now it's actually... To so, sort of, uh, because you talked about depression <laughs> uh, in, in terms of, of the um, uh, climate change and so on. And uh, so there's also talk of the sun dying. Uh, given the enormous measure of, of the sun, I doubt that that is for uh, no, no, no. very quick. No, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, I think we will all yeah. die out before the sun. Yeah, sun it looks is like if it. Yeah. <laughs> If you look at the, the age of the sun, the sun is uh, like a teenager yeah. now, so yeah. I mean... No, uh, no, it's about half of its cycle, no, right? No, it's, it's, it's a still point. teenager, I mean kind of youngish. Half of its cycle yeah. until yeah. it goes to red giant. Yeah, yeah. yes, 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 yes. until the red giant, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I yeah, should yeah. not be more. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And yeah. No, no, I'm not directly worried, but, 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 but uh, <laughs> are there more... Suns like this in, in the universe, is that known? Whether of course, yeah. Yeah. this is why we say and this sun yeah. uh, when we speak in English. Yeah, but this, this size, sun, this size it's of sun. Only our yeah. Of course, it's, yeah. a, it's a medium uh, so, uh, star. Yeah. 
And then the final question that I'm going to ask, and then I'll definitely give the word to the audience, or to Peppa, who's also keen to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very guilty about something, so I want to fix it. Yeah, the, um, the sound that you use in your installations, uh, Nikki, yes. uh, is that, do you make use of these radio waves, or, or not at all? Yeah, uh, the electromagnetic waves from the, 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 the listening to the Aurora Borealis with the VLF, yeah. uh, so the very low frequency antennas, we used uh, for the sound score of the, 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 the film uh, that I showed, and, yeah. uh, but also also other recordings of, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah so in that yeah. case we, uh, we but you mix it a bit with this science fiction no no that's the other that's installation no no that's, the other that's installation. what i want to say yeah. not mix in the same installation but yeah you you use both so aspects. for that thing uh, the video installation liquid solid uh, we also used uh, singing of the whales because uh, we didn't make our own recordings but we used the one that were used for the voyager uh yeah uh, me that was sent into space and uh, um yeah uh, it's 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 many recordings and uh, yeah yeah yeah. Shall we first let Pippa fix her problem? And now maybe yeah. we can ask questions. <laughs> we can see that. But yes. I wanted. I feel guilty because um, so it, one, um, with Jasmine we uh, collaborated particularly on one project, and I feel guilty because we didn't show uh, the, the. I didn't show the project. It's, I'm very guilty. And also my summification is based on on that research on exactly on on the radio data. So uh, first I'm going to show the drawings because it was kind of collaboration between two of us. It's a, it's a project we did together. And I have just, uh, I'll just okay, okay. Sh briefly show okay. just one image because, um, I mean, I, I, get, I assume most of you are artists. Mm -hmm. So as artists, we know uh, our methods of working. So you remember from her uh, presentation, uh, the radio, uh, the data is usually uh, in visually represented. So I kind of decided to make my own data which I give to uh, Jasmina to translate for me. This is uh, like in a seal screen technique where I'm just with the squeegee I smudged uh, stains of paint. In a way they look like uh, spectrograms but they're much different. Uh, something what I do also with the uh, surfaces of uh, the sun and the, the, the plasma of the sun presented in glass. This is another way of translation which is I make fictional uh, solar data. Nice thing about this project is that Jasmina managed to find phenomena in these fictional uh, spectrograms, which mm -hmm. are really graphical works. So there is a zebra patterns, there is a fibers. Mm -hmm. So this is radio fine structures. Super, uh, super. Uh, this is a type four continuum. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Type four continuum burst, which she was is, talking about. Is that your about. handwriting? Yes. Ah, yes. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you really diagnosed. Yeah, this, yeah, this, I, this they drawing. gave me yeah, a, yeah. a bunch of uh, paintings and I said, okay, yeah, and I just draw it like fast, huh? and yeah, I wrote yeah. it, okay, yeah. I see this. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we share um, co-authorship on this work. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> so, audience, any questions? Yeah. Uh, I had a question. Um, I was wondering what is the impact of the geomagnetic storms or the electromagnetic activity of the sun on Earth, not talking about the electronics but on uh, bodies, uh, living organisms, mm -hmm. elements of the Earth, because we always talk about these electronics, but yeah, when we're in these very uh, strong storms, what is actually, what the, how does it affect us? Or it, it's a it's a very good question. Actually, mm, there are a lot of like there is a lot of impact on the bio life as well. Um, I guess many of you are aware that you know, for example, birds they they fly north and south, and <laughs> so they they kind of have this intrinsic uh, uh, connection to magnetic field or sensors for the magnetic field. So whenever there is a strong geomagnetic storm, for example, it can influence their orientation. And same is true for many animals, actually. So there are a lot of animals that have this uh, uh, sensitivity to the magnetic field. So for them, it's important uh, for just for orientation, for the sense of direction. There's also a lot of minerals that would, you know, like different types of rocks and stuff like this. They would also be sensitive, so they would, in, in a way, change properties. 
but yeah for the bio life at least for animals for sure this is true like they can get disoriented and like go to the wrong place so uh, yeah instead of reaching a warmer climate they could go to a harsh conditions and that's not nice right so <laughs> is that also influenced by by the effects of the moon because i mean we also talk a lot about influences the by the moon. It's, it's of course a different kind of. Uh, the, the moon rather reflects the sun, but but still there's also an effect of the moon on, on what is happening on Earth. So yeah, there how is do they interact then? Of course, we have different effects in yeah. the and they, so they are all playing uh, playing yeah. a role. In, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so I mean, there are even some studies like there have been certain studies trying to correlate. Uh, I mean, you know, some people, for example, would say that they have headaches when there is a geomagnetic storm, or then they would could be like uh, some people try to correlate um, problems with uh, cardiovascular uh, system, like you know, increased chance of heart attacks. Uh, so yeah, there are it, some it, studies it, it, like this. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them do show cor correlation, but of course, it's limited data set, so it's impossible to say. I would say a healthy, strong organism would probably. Mm, not not feel or not not become sick from a strong geomagnetic storm. Uh, maybe someone with predisposed conditions could be a bit more sensitive, and therefore there there could be like a higher impact. So, but there yeah. was I think in your presentation a slide where there was an uh, image of an astronaut, yeah. and that they could have problems with nausea and and lower blood uh, count or something. Uh, so I put there on the impacts of the astronauts, particularly like from the radiation point of view, so oh from yeah. the energetic particles, okay. and yeah. not so much from the magnetic fields. Okay. But, um, yeah. Because yeah. I heard also, I don't know if it's true, but maybe Pepe knows this also. That there were more wars when the sun was active, like they looked back. Yeah, that's what Chichevsky was actually oh, okay. kind of proving because he was comparing data um, from like revolutions appearing. He was mm -hmm. actually associating with, with high uh, solar activity. Mm -hmm. But he really did like really in the cycles. He, you, you need like a long period. Like the method is called his hysterium, his mm -hmm. hysteriometry, when you need like really da uh, mm -hmm. data in longer periods. Mm -hmm to really compare if there is correlation. So let's say if you're 150 years and you know like how many wars and which kind of regions we had, and we compare it with the solar cycles. And the sun has like 11.2 uh, solar cycles, but it has also 50, 100 year cycles. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. only the most common 11.2. So there is uh, more cycle, uh, cycles which um, scientists uh, are researching. Mm -hmm. And he had found correlations. But also he had found correlations between the uh, exposures like epidemics, uh, like uh, with the plague, uh, with the cholera, and so on. Mm -hmm. He was researching also. But when I started reading, he was even comparing data of how, how many pregnancies there were <laughs> that year. <laughs> it's like, oh, it like, or like the, how much harvest they have collected. But of course, this also can be a... Uh, Due to other like uh, things which are happening on our, on Earth, could be like I don't know a volcano explosion, mm -hmm. a colder climate suddenly, and that would also it's it, some of the some of the things that don't have to be necessarily correlated to the sun, but maybe with activities on the climate of the Earth. I could say that sometimes you can have very good correlations for things that coexist, but not necessarily trigger each other or are not necessarily, you know, related. So <laughs> I think some people have tried to make correlations between, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, saving uh, saving electricity and drinking out. <laughs> like mm -hmm. you can have a correlation, but uh, it's not like... Uh, Correl correlation doesn't mean causation. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. that's the point. That's the, point I think, mm -hmm. yeah. the point is that we are talking about a very complex system and one-to-one -one correlation and one-to-one -one corresponds and doesn't, doesn't work. So what is happening is that like, a level of the solar activity influences the the, uh, the Earth magnetosphere, so it also causes the, the the thinning or thickening of the different layers of the Earth atmosphere, which is which can be instantaneously, but also uh, which means that it influences the climate. So now you can say, okay, uh, uh, you cannot say that the, that there are more pregnant women because uh, of, of the sun's activity. And on the other hand, 
there is, uh, let's imagine that the winter was longer, there will be more pregnant women. So, so and, the, and the climate is actually uh, related with the solar activity. Of course, we are people, we are also influencing very strongly on the climate mm -hmm. ourselves. So there are different, different correspondences. For example, there were more happier people during low level of activity. Can we say that? Mm, I don't know, huh? mm. probably not. But mm. you can say, there was more light, there was more yeah, sunny days yes. during that interval. And that is because the climate has changed. So, mm. so you see that there is no direct impact, mm. but it can be very indirect. Of course, in the history, there was also direct ones, a very direct ones for yeah. astrophysicists who did not forecast it well the, the total eclipse and they were killed mm. from, from the kings and empires because they did not forecast it because people uh, they, they just, uh, they were afraid, it was so mystical, it was so strange, but suddenly everything becomes dark and animals become quiet as a night and it's like everything changes and, and people when they didn't understand, especially not educated ones uh, and, uh, and emperors were often not educated as we know, so they, they are afraid of unknown. And then when the astrophysicists were not able to properly predict the, the total eclipse, so we, then they were killed simply. Mm -hmm. And there many of the astrophysicists were, were actually uh, finished on that. A way, dangerous yeah? occupation. Like yes, yeah. so it was a dangerous occupation. So yeah. if you ask directly, I, I would say that's also quite direct mm -hmm. impacting. Yeah, and that was the time they would say like, because of the coral, uh, because of the stars being on that, I don't know what, we have more harvest or less harvest and then suddenly something mm -hmm. happened and there's nothing to eat. So scientists in, <laughs> in a prehistorical kind of... Uh, it was a dangerous occupation. Mm -hmm. yes. mm. <laughs> but also there is another thing which, which we can see, it's, it's also, yeah, like, even if the animals are the mainly, mostly visibly uh, uh, impacted by the level of solar activity, if you look, uh, uh, for example, the, 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 the goats, I don't know the English, I'm not sure, the, the rims of, of the tree, so the rims of the tree will also be differently spaced depending on the level of the solar activity. Mm. So I think I've read an article once from one of the Stradivari's uh, yeah, violins yeah, were yeah, made yeah, fr yeah. from the yeah. wood mm -hmm. where it was visible that it's very old wood from still the mound or minimum time. And they could see the, the, by, the, by the wood, the, the traces in the wood that actually it comes from that time. And the violin was also better than any other? <laughs> <laughs> I guess more expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More yeah. Sure. Yeah. There's a question in the back. Yeah. Two actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you two. You first. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, for wonderful presentations. Uh, I have a question about cross-sectoral collaboration because I do believe that there is a lot that science and art history actually share. But I wonder how did you experience it and was it easy to find a common language or were, were there misunderstandings like how did this work for you? Yeah, it's an interesting <coughs> question because I, in 2010 or between 2007-2010 I worked on a project for the University of Leuven and, and uh, with a show that was uh, presented in Museum M and that was also about the collaboration between artists mm -hmm. and scientists and there were some scientists that were a bit like, well, if the artist has a question, let them come to us. And others had more of a curiosity, and those collaborations were much more interesting if there was a curiosity from both sides in what the other was doing. So uh, the first scientist was a bit like, well, I'm the scientist, eh? so I'm better than anyone else. And that, but that, that didn't really work, but yeah. Maybe. I must say that I was very fascinated, for example, to listen to your talk, uh, Nikki, because I find, like, I used to work on turbulence, so this was my scientific <laughs> work before, and I was doing these simulations that would represent, like, so closely, like, well, you know, what you're doing, so it's really the turbulence in a different setting, but it's turbulence, and it looks so similar, and so I was like, wow, that's really amazing, like, how, how many similarities, or so how, how many common things there are. Mm. And, well, it could be just me, but I personally have true fascination for the fact that you are really reaching out to scientists as well and trying to unite uh, 
I mean, to, to bring it to a broader audience, like uh, in a way, in a different scope, to bring science to a broader audience and to, to place it somewhere in different settings on Earth, on the impact on, on you know, how we feel, how yeah. what we do. So to make it like very hurtly, very easy to understand, uh, I, I do appreciate that a lot. And I also think that we don't have dedicated time on that. It's just that yeah. we are mm. sometimes overly busy. We mm. are so busy that it's difficult to struggle like just coping with your current uh, activities and then um, it's yeah it's going to be a little bit like it sounds bad but you know it's it's considered like well you cannot do your job so why you are you looking like for a side side project you know mm. it's, it's difficult mm. it's mm. difficult to balance mm. but but in in what you were just mm. saying at the end I, f I think because it's uh, Art and science were in the past much more closer. Right? Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, what you were saying in, in, in your presentation at the end, I, I felt that coming back, sort of like realizing that the images that you produce have an art, in a way, an artistic feel as well. And it's also clear that quite a lot of scientists, in the way that they look at their data, quite often have a more or less, well, Artistic quality, wh whether it's in t in 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 a way of an intuit intuition intuition uh, that they use, or th that quite often art and science are much more closer to each other than than we think. Actually, in in the way of, of how we deal with, uh, I mean, you you were saying, well, uh, an art we ca the sun will never reproduce the same image, but an artist basically never does that either so uh, these images were never the same which yeah. uh, which just mean i was presenting so yeah. she was very familiar like okay this is yeah. always going to be a different one yeah so uh, it's natural that uh, artists will always want to reproduce themselves and also the turbulence you would never get the same soap uh, yeah. no never no. No. no that's also ongoing there was a, one other question in the back yeah oh, yeah um thank you for the presentations also. Um, it was very interesting actually to see how um, when the scientists were doing their presentations, how through this kind of rigorous uh, observation, we come to understand uh, what we know uh, through the sun, about the sun, or the scientific knowledge of the sun, right? So it was very interesting to see how this kind of series of observations from afar gives us this knowledge of this very specific scientific knowledge and then how, for example, in the artworks, some of that data was 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 coming through in the pieces, even if it's, for example, ultra-low frequencies coming into the sonification. So I was actually just wondering for all of you whether it happens on occasion or often or at all to consider or to be inspired by or to even take into account more uh, like non-scientific knowledge about the sun, like non-modern ontologies or anything that's not a kind of scientific knowledge uh, about the sun. Is that something that comes into your practices at all? <coughs> I think for me, uh, to be honest, I, 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 I don't approach it scientifically. I approach it uh, more em experimental or empirically by observing or by doing and so I also don't uh, pretend that I'm doing something scientific it's just that uh, it's an inspiration or usually I know like one thing about a certain phenomena or a thing and that I start to explore and work with so I, I and and so like also in Finland when we were doing all these experiments like why uh, is the color disappearing uh, 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 of the so of the iridescent soap film at these certain temperatures? And then you start to think of your own uh, uh, hypothesis. How do you say a theory? Why this could be? But if it's true, I have no idea. It's just so for me. It's this is my way of working, like uh, by uh, by doing experiments and just uh, seeing. That's very much like experimental science. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do it. <laughs> we observe, we observe, yeah, yeah, and we try yeah. to yeah. Yeah. come yeah, up with some see. understanding. Yeah. But maybe with the difference that for me the outcome doesn't have to be true. <laughs> like it has, doesn't have to be scientifically correct uh, or uh, yeah, a proven hypo hypothesis.
like you tell stories. Yeah, but with me was uh, something I, I heard from all the scientists I worked with. Like when I was reading about Chizhevsky, who wrote his books in the 30s, in the last century, he was talking about the, the sense of feeling he had. He didn't have the knowledge, he didn't have all the data. He said, I have this feeling that the sun and the earth are interconnected. And then he tried to see how, how this might be. But it was a feeling, so he was driven by that. So I, I found this similarity sometimes as an artist or you know, just as a human being, we, we, we're driven by a feeling we have about something and then we see what comes out. Um, I really think this also exists in science. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, maybe not so uh, uh, expected from many of you to hear, but uh, yeah, many times we had like some guts feeling and it's like, oh, I had the feeling about it. Exactly, you know? but that, that is what I, I just meant, where, yeah. where it comes really close to each other. Yeah, I yeah. think we need to stop here because we, you have yeah, one very, very simple, last question, simple else. question yeah, the yeah. distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, it changes over a year, probably, uh, the Earth going around the yeah. sun. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. does it change over the centuries? Is it going further away or closer? Mm -hmm. or anything? Does it change? Or does it really stay? Does it stay? Really? Does it come closer? Is it that the moon goes a little bit away? <laughs> Yeah, but the, 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 it's relative. The, orbit, the orbits are, are not really circular, they are like yeah, expanding. Yeah. The universe is expanding, so the Earth should go further away from the sun? No, That's right? not on the, on the scale that we would measure it. Yeah. We don't measure it. Yeah. Yeah. So don't worry yeah, else. Uh, <laughs> so so let's, if let's... If I can say something yeah, yeah. still, it's you just one thing. Know. When we were talking about <laughs> the science and, and the art, I am, I'm a real scientist. I mean, I really believe. No, yeah, it's, we believe I, I don't yeah. find the, the, uh, maybe something too non-scientific. Uh, yeah. But what I always say to my students and what I sincerely believe is like, if you have no imagination, you will not be good scientists. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's, that's a wonderful <laughs> thing to end with. So, uh, because, well, it's clear that this was a fantastic subject because normally our talks are an hour and a half. We've now been talking for about two hours and I'm, I'm sure we could go on, but you need to go home to finish your projects. I know that. So thank you very much. And for our fantastic panelists, for our fantastic uh, moderator, and thank you very much for Nick to host us uh, here. So just uh, collaboration between science, art, and uh, organizations. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming.